Welcome once again, folks, to the Hour of the Time and our ongoing series of the exposure of the origins, the history, the doctrine, and the identity of Mystery Babylon. I'm William Cooper. Many of you have written letters and asked, how does one get into the Mystery School since no one ever hears anything about it? And there appears not to be a campaign of recruitment, and you're absolutely right. In our research, we have found the requirements to be simple, be of sound mind and body, have a sincere desire to be illumined, and simply knock up on the door. Well, to continue, remember that the first religion in the world was the religion of the worship of the heavens. And man eventually came to recognize the sun as the representation of the power and the ability of the hidden God of the universe, the invisible God of the universe, the all-powerful creator of everything. But man, as he gained his intellectual ability, began to look toward himself, toward the intellect as that God and the sun, the representation of what used to be the invisible God of the universe, then became the representation of the intellect, the light, Lucifer. And man began to worship the Luciferian philosophy. He believed, these people who call themselves the guardians of the secrets of the ages, and still believe that man was held prisoner in the Garden of Eden by an unjust, vindictive, and very cruel God, the God of the Bible and that he was set free from the bonds of ignorance through the gift of intellect given to him by Lucifer through his agent, Satan. Now, many people believe that Lucifer and Satan are the same individual entity, and they may be. I don't know the answer to that. I just know what the mystery schools believe, and I know what I personally believe, and what I personally believe doesn't have any bearing on anything. Knowledge, the truth is what counts and that's what we're trying to get to the bottom of here now eventually this philosophy of worshiping worshiping the intellect or wisdom or the mind became known as Gnosticism and the followers of Gnosticism began to be known as the Gnostics in extraordinary number folks of exceedingly bizarre talismans and inscribed stones bear witness to the power of the secret Gnostic organizations which flourished in various forms during the few centuries immediately before and after the rise of Christianity in the Middle East. You see, one of the oddest emblems of these schools was the figure of Abraxas. Now that's a human body clothed in a Roman soldier's garb wielding a battle axe as if threatening an enemy. Now in its left hand it carried an elliptical shield upon which the words of power IAO and Saboeth were sometimes written. The head of this fearsome being was that of a cock with open beak. Now that symbolized the rising of the morning sun because the cock crows with the sunrise. For legs it had twin serpents. The serpent throughout history has always been a symbol for wisdom, the gift of intellect coiling to either side. Underneath the figure sometimes lay a conventionalized thunderbolt. Now who was Abraxas? His name in accordance with Kabbalistic computation is decoded to mean 365. Isn't it absolutely incredible that every single time we investigate one of these it leads directly to the sun? 
For 365 days are the number of days in the year, or the exact number of days that it takes the earth to make one revolution around the sun. Amazing. There was no god or idol belonging to the society, and this is where man made the transition from worshipping a god to worshipping the mind. The Abraxas figure merely represented the aspects of power which went to make up the supreme intelligence, the all-power. The body was man himself. The bird stood for intelligence and the hailing of light, illumination, which is the cock's habit at dawn. The tunic represented the need for struggle or revolution, socialism. The arms, the protection and power given by the dedication to the gnosis or knowledge. The shield was wisdom, the club or whip, power. The two snakes meant noose, insight, and logos, understanding, primordial knowing, which was the gift from Satan, the snake, the serpent. By means of this diagram, Gnostic teachers inculcated the theory that man comes to his full power by developing certain facets of his mind. He must struggle to arrive at gnosis. But this knowledge is of the mystical kind and is not the mere collection of facts. You see, great stress was laid upon personal mystical experience to and through which the initiate was guided under conditions of great secrecy. The Gnostics did not confine their studies or their teachings to any one religion, but borrowed illustrations from all that were accessible to them. This caused them to be considered Christians, heretics, Jews who were trying to undermine Christianity, remnants of the Persian sun worshippers. They have been widely studied by early Christian sages, and it is upon the opinions of these latter that many conclusions have been formed. Little or no investigation of these, quote, people of wisdom, unquote, has been done by research workers on the spot in Asia and North Africa, where strong and interesting traces of their beliefs and practices still remain. The main teaching states that there is a supreme being or power which is invisible and has no perceptible form. It is pantheism. This power is the one which can be contacted by mankind, and it is through it that man can control himself and work out his destiny. The various religious teachers through the ages, putting their creeds in many different ways, were in contact with this power they claim, and the religions all contain a more or less hidden kernel of initiation. Now this is the secret which the knowers can communicate to their disciples. But the secret can be acquired only through exercising the mind and body until the terrestrial man is so refined as to be able to become a vehicle for the use of this power, or, in their terms, illumined. Eventually, the initiate becomes identified with the power, and in the end he attains his true destiny as purified personality, infinitely superior to the rest of unenlightened mankind to the state of apotheosis where he himself is God. The symbolism in which this teaching is concealed, the methods by which the mystical power is attained, vary from one Gnostic society to another, but the constant factor is there the attainment of that which humankind unconsciously needs. You see, the Gnostic claims that within every man and woman there is an unfulfilled urge which cannot be given any proper expression in the normal way because there is no social means by which it can be fulfilled. This feeling has been put into man in order that he may seek the fulfillment which the Gnostics can give him his search for completeness in love, trade, professions, theology, is vain and unsuccessful. The theories of the various schools, folks, of Gnosticism with which the Christian clerics came into contact are very much secondary to the rituals and practices which are used to produce the Gnosis, the Enlightenment, the Illumination. This has not been fully understood by too many people who devote much space in trying to work out the beliefs of the knowers by a perusal of their writings or by reports which have been given them by others. 
simply, folks, because they do not understand the symbolism. It is not clear to them. It is veiled. It is the esoteric wisdom. What were and are the Gnostic practices? Well, first...